used. To nephrologists, this is also a very good drug because this acts on the two important channels. Number one acts on the L channel, number two it acts on the T channel, L and N. These two are the important channels and which we always prefer because they produce intraglomerular capillary dilatation. The other drugs like ARBs and AC, they only do the afferent arterial dilatation, not the efferent one. So they dilate and the intraglomerular pressure is not taken care of. The calcium channel blocker primarily, all they take care of the intraglomerular hypertension as well as increase the renal blood flow. And they also take care of the associated cardiac component because they are present on the ventricle wall. The other comorbid condition, rightly said before, the peripheral artery diseases, peripheral vascular diseases, where we need peripheral vasodilatation, they are the drug of the choice. As well as those patients who have got the associated migraine. At a time it was being used as a drug for the migraine as well. So it has got another advantage to use over there. These are the comorbid conditions where the calcium plan blocker should be preferred. So, uh, very well explained by Professor Kamla Katrapati, sir. Uh, participants, you keep on pouring your questions because these questions will be taken up by our panelists. So, I'm waiting for your questions. You can put them on chat box or question and session wherever you want. Uh, proceeding further, my next question is to Dr. Manoj Srivastava, and this is regarding what are the absolute and relative contraindications of CCB? Because any drug can be used wisely if we know the relative and absolute contraindications. They are very, very important. So Dr. Manoj Sivastra, sir, please tell us what are the absolute and relative contraindications. These calcium channel blockers are being used very widely by most physicians as far as hypertension is concerned. And I think it's very important that we should know when not to use CCBs. Now for the dihydropyridine group of CCBs, the absolute contraindication is any form of obstruction to the cardiac flow, whether it's severe aortic stenosis, where there's hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or any other obstruction. Now in that situation, CCBs are an absolute contraindication. Other situation could be, as Dr. Vey Gupta was talking about, in acute situations like impending myocardial infarction, a progressive unstable angina. These are situations where there might be some degree of reflex adrenogenic stimulation by giving these drugs. So these drugs should be avoided in acute situations. Then of course, if the systolic, uh, the systolic failure is there, then in that situation again, these drugs should be avoided. There are better drugs available which should be used. And one important thing that I would like to comment is that in patients with liver failure, now this drug, the half-life of this drug goes on increasing. The usual half-life is around 35 to 40 hours and it can go up to 56 to 60 hours if the patient has got decompensated liver disease. Now in those situations, these drugs should be avoided or their dose should be reduced or one should monitor the blood pressure in these patients if you are want to continue with these drugs for some reason or the other. For the non-dihydropyridine, of course, there are certain definite indications where you should, contraindication where you should not be using these drugs. Of course, patients with poor LV function Diltiazem and verapamil, both the drugs should be avoided. Along with that, any nodal disease like sick sinus syndrome, again, these drugs should be, not be used. And then, again, in patients for WBW syndrome, where you, by using these drugs, you can further accelerate the, what you call the AV nodal blockage and further increase what you call the conduction through the accessory pathways. So these are situations which can be very dangerous. So I think these are some of the absolute contraindications. Relative contraindication, of course, would depend upon the side effect profile that the patient is having. If he's having a lot of pedal edema, a lot of constipation, a lot of what you call a, a problem of dizziness, etc. And if he's not able to tolerate the drug because of some allergic reactions, of course, these drugs need to be withdrawn. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, we know that 50% uh, of the heart failure is uh, having hypertension. And hypertension can lead to heart failure, it is very well known. So my question to Professor Dr. Vivek Gupta is that uh, whether the CCB can be used in heart failure? Uh, so again, coming from the basics to, uh, to the final things, because you see the heart failure, what is heart failure? For general, I think uh, nursing, I'm sure that a lot of people will be watching this, um, uh, which are non-physicians. So let me tell you, a lot of patients feel that heart failure means heart fail. Ho gaya. That is not true. Heart failure means whenever the heart is not able to pump the blood which is commensurate to the requirement 
which is required by the body. Uh, there are two types of heart failure. One is, of course, systolic heart failure, where you have a reduction in the pumping and contractility of the heart. This is very important. These are that means reject, ejection fraction, which is measured by 2D echocardiography and also by left ventricular angiography. When we do coronary angiography, we also do left left ventricular angiography, and we have estimation methods by which we can estimate how much is the systolic function, which is done by echocardiography, I repeat, mostly or by left ventriculography. Uh, the normal estimation of a left ventricular ejection fraction is about 60%, which is considered to be normal. If it is 55% by echo or by LV uh, ventriculography, that is also considered to be normal. If it is less than 45%, we call it as a heart failure. If it is less than 35%, which is moderate LV systolic dysfunction, where we are, there's an indication for putting automatic intracardiac defibrillator, which is known as AICD, because these are the patients who have got more, got, got more chances and they're susceptible to sudden cardiac arrest. The difference between the heart failure and cardiac arrest is cardiac arrest, the patient, of course, the heart is getting arrested and there's no function at all. There's no movement and there's no uh, contractility, while heart failure is reduced. Second type of heart failure is whenever the patient's systolic function is normal, that is known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that happens in mostly the patient who has got a severe left ventricular hypertrophy or the patient who has got accelerated hypertension. Because the diastolic function is reduced, that means the patient does not, the heart does not relax to the extent we should relax. And that leads to again pulmonary venous hypertension. What causes breathlessness for the interest of the people who are understanding, although nursing is a physiologist, he himself understands everything and he can explain it better than me. But what causes high, uh, the breathlessness is because whenever the, there's a reduced ejection fraction or there's a reduced uh, relaxation in both the conditions, the pulmonary vasculature is affected and there is a pulmonary venous condition or and that leads to decreased oxygenation across the, uh, uh, the bronchioles and arterial at the pulmonary vasculature and therefore the patient requirement number of breaths are more and the patient becomes dyspneic and that becomes quite troublesome. This is known as heart failure leading to breathlessness and the patient is very uncomfortable. And when there is severe systolic dysfunction, the patient's blood pressure will also go down. Although in, in the heart failure with reduced, with preserved ejection fraction, the blood pressure remains normal. Coming on to the treatment part. Of course, the treatment is mostly diuretic. You have to give the take out the fluid in systolic heart failure as soon as possible by intravenous diuretics. And of course, you have there a role of beta blockers in the chronic heart failure, not in acute heart failure. In acute heart failure, you have to reduce the heart rate by giving a lot of medicines like beta blockers to be given to the judicially. But the coming, to the calcium coming to the calcium blockers, the calcium blockers are normally contraindicated, normally contraindicated in most of the condition of systolic heart failure, especially. But sometimes if there is a patient who's already taking amlodipine, already taking amlodipine, amlodipine does not reduce systolic dysfunction, does not reduce the systolic functions, and therefore it can be continued with the patient already. We see the prescription, patient coming to trials. And of course, you would like to change the medicines. You have to give intravenous lasix, desoxin, intravenous nitroglycerin, because that also causes a lot of help in reducing, and sometimes intravenous morphine is required in acute pulmonary edema. So these are the, but amlodipine can be continued, but this is not a first line treatment. Coming on to the deltaism and verapamil, they are absolutely contraindicated, especially in systolic heart failure. But in the preserved ejection fraction, there is a, still a debate going on, but calcium kernels do not stay as a first line treatment of any heart failure, unless it's a continuation that means, especially the phenodipine and also amlodipine, they, are, they can be considered to be continued not to be treated. I think this answers the question for the heart failure. As such, calcium gel blockers for heart failure as a primary treatment is not there. A very, very nice answer. I think uh, this question I just put up just because I have seen a lot of prescriptions of heart failure having the Vimada and other, other drugs and also having one calcium gel blocker, even nifedipine I have seen. That is why I wanted to have the clarity on the subject that Calcium tumor blockers are not a good option for treating heart failure. Very, very a nice answer. And uh, moving further, uh, Professor Kamla Katripati, sir, has already thrown upon and said about the L, N, and T channel concept. Uh, I would like to ask to him again to talk about this concept in uh, detail and 
tell us that in what situation you would like to block only L channel or only LT channel, R N channel, all all the three channels you like to block. And similarly, one question has also been asked by our one pa participant, uh, Dr. Vinod Dalde, and that is that explain the comparison on the amlodipine and sildenafil. This they, he wanted to have which should be the first choice of CCB in hypertension and also with diabetic hypertension. As okay. I said before also, Dr. Verma, yeah. see, the, we have the all calcium channel blocker is relatively blocking capacity. It's not the 100%. Yeah. And I have a paper right now, there's no point of showing it, but I can show you that all amlodipine, benedipine, seredipine, dihydropyridine, all non dihydropyridine they have some potential. It's only the quantum is lesser or more. Now, it starts from the nephredipine, the classical one, which blocks L-type, but it has a little effect on N-type and T-type. Amlodipine, the age-old, very potent calcium channel blocker, has effect on the L-type. Cylindropine has action on the L as well as N on both. Ifodipine, there's another one, which has action on L-type and T-type. And then we have the traditional, now we understand now, benedipine has action on the three, L and T, partially on the P and Q and R. Now the reason being, if we are blocking the L type of calcium channel, then it would decrease the contractibility of the heart. It would increase the pulse because of this sympathetic nervous system stimulation. And it would also increase to some extent the glomerular pressure because the afferent arteriolar dilatation, efferent arterial is not affected. When you go to the end type channel, as Dr. Gupta already said, end type channel has potentials to decrease the heart rate because they act on the SA node as well as and through the terminal. They also decrease the pulse rate. On contrary, the L type increase the pulse rate. End type decrease the pulse rate and they also decrease the glomerular pressure. So N-type channel has the advantage in decreasing the heart rate, not producing reflux tachycardia, in decreasing pulse rate, like we have the traditional one, Dr. Varapamil, and he also talked about delta jam. They also decrease the glomerular pressure. I'm talking in isolation channel. I'm not talking the compound effect. T-type had advantage. They decrease the heart rate. They also do not produce the reflux tachycardia. They decrease the glomerular pressure. Additionally, they also decrease the aldosterone secretion. So all these channels have relative action, but it is the dominant action which is translated into the pharmacological response. And therefore, when you are using a ca traditional calcium channel blocker, what I said about the nifedipine or algidipine or the benedipine and amlodipine, they all have potentials, but these are indifferent. But dominant the action is every calcium channel blocker would act on the L. L means on the ventricular wall, on the arterial wall, on the peripheral artery. Only action differs on the relative bradycardia, the heart rate, and intraglomerular pressure, and additional advantage of the T-type on the aldosterone secretion. And therefore, those patients, and rightly said also, it is also rightly said that the calcium channel blocker is not a drug of choice in congestive heart failure. And the reason being very simple, that they dilate and they do peripheral vasodilatation, which is already a component in the congestive heart failure, that would probably increase peripheral edema, pedal edema, these are the limitations that would enhance it. And that is the reason why we are looking for a molecule, the benign molecule, which primarily blocks L channel, also blocks the T channel, and the resultant action would be a good action of the preferred vasodilatation, a good action on the glomerular pressure, as well as also a good action on the aldosterone secretion. Go ahead, sir. Dr. Verma. Dr. Narsing Verma, are you listening to me? Verma, I think he's not. Verma ji got uh, out of... We lost, lost the connection, I suppose. He lost Dr. connection. Verma. You, know, you become the moderator now. Okay. So we're just yes. going ahead with the question that was asked in the chat box about yes. the difference yes. in the... 
uh, is he back? No. So we'll just looking at one of these questions, but there was a basic comparison between cylindropine and the amlodipine and whether there is any superiority of the newer drugs over the older ones that we've been using. Now, amlodipine, we can take it as the, what you call the prototype of the calcium channel blockers because no longer we are using nifedipine because of some reason or the other. So, amlodipine is now considered to be the prototype of calcium channel blocker. The newer calcium channel blockers have now to be compared basically with amlodipine. And whenever we have a newer drug, we are looking at number one, the efficacy of the drug. And any newer drug that has come is basically a better drug as far as the efficacy is concerned. And number two, a better drug in terms of safety. So if the efficacy is the same, then we have to look at the safety profile. Now, as we already know that uh, Dr. Uh, Tripathi was already talking about that amlodipine primarily acts on the L channel and cylindipine is one which acts on L as well as N channel. Now the N channel, calcium channels are present on the neurons. So when you give an L plus N inhibitor, a calcium channel blocker. Then what you are going to do is you are going to produce waste dilatation, very similar to amlodipine. And then there would be some degree of adrenergic drive because of the uh, waste dilatation. And this adrenergic drive through the neurons can be blocked by the N channel. So now when you're using cylindipine, then what you'll find is that you will have the waste dilatation, you'll have the, the antihypertensive effect. Plus on the other hand, the adrenergic drive is limited to some extent, so you will not have the reflex tachycardia that most of the uh, patients on amlodipine usually have, even though they are less as compared to nifedipine, but they still have it because it is primarily an L blocker. So I would prefer to use cylindipine in those patients of hypertension who have an increased adrenergic drive, patients who have got white coat hypertension, patients who have got stress-induced hypertension. Now, these are the patients who've got an in increased adrenergic drive, and if we can block the adrenergic drive in these patients, we'll have a better response. Patients who present with a lot of patients come to us with palpitation and uh, hypertension. A lot of anxiety element is there, which is further aggravating the adrenergic response. So, pain, you remember as a drug which not only vasodilates but also blocks the adrenergic drive to some extent. So in those situations where you probably like to add a beta blocker, you can simply use a cylindipede and you can do the, both the functions of bringing down the blood pressure as well as blocking the adrenergic drive. So I think that probably answers the question about the uh, difference between cylindipede and amlodipine. But remember, there are more evidence, more robust evidence with amlodipine as far as the blood pressure reduction is concerned. Uh, I think the question has been answered very well. Uh, there is one thought that uh, most of the antihypertensive effect is by virtue of uh, L-type channel blocking, not by N and T-type blocking. So all other effects which are not related to only hypertension, they are by advantage by blocking the N and T channel. But the robust antihypertensive effect cannot be there unless we block the L channel. So I think uh, this issue has been uh, very well cleared by our panelists. I will request the, uh, uh, the participant that please type your questions again because of the, this interruption. I have lost the question from the question and session. So please retype them. I'm sorry for that. And moving further till the new questions are coming, I will uh, ask the new question again to the... Uh, this question I think uh, Dr. Manoj has already taken that uh, switching to newer CCBs are still having faith. Chat, chat question. You have already talked about it. Was it was on the chat box. Okay, okay. So now, Dr. Manoj Srivastava, the next question is whether you have switched to newer CCBs in your, your practice are you still having faith in amlodipine, uh, continuing amlodipine. As I already said in your previous answer, the evidence still backs amlodipine. The number of patients in the trial, the, the size of the trial, the duration of the trials, all of them suggest that amlodipine trials are much superior as compared to the trials of the other newer CCBs. So the evidence favors amlodipine. But again, as I said, any newer drug that comes in, comes with certain safety what you call uh, buttons, which were not there in the previous molecule. And that is the reason why these new molecules have to be introduced in the market. Otherwise, we were doing quite well with amlodipine. 
So whatever were the side effect profile of the amlodipine, they have been taken care of by the newer drugs that have come in. Now, as far as the efficacy or the antihypertensive efficacy is concerned, I think amlodipine is still doing wonders. All we are looking at are the side effect profile. The commonest side effect profile is the pedal edema. Now, this pedal edema occurs because the L channels are present only on the arteriolar side and not on the venular side. So, when you give these drugs, the arterioles, they dilate, the capillaries are full with the blood and the venules are not dilating. So, what is actually happening, the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries increase and the interstitial fluid, uh, I mean, the, the, the fluid from the capillaries, they pass into the interstitial space. So, the interstitial fluid compartment increases in size and you have pedal edema. Another important concept is that when you give these L channels, the lymphatics also have got smooth muscles. And these lymphatics basically squeeze out the interstitial fluid from the um, extracellular space and thereby reduce the edema. Now, if you give these L channel blockers, then the smooth muscle in the lymphatics are also blocked. So the lymphatics are also not functioning to that extent. So what actually is happening is that you continue to have extra amount of fluid in the ECF or the interstitial space. Now, these newer drugs, for example, the T channels, the T channels are present on the venular side as well. So when you give a T channel blocker, the venues, they open up and therefore the pedal edema is reduced to a large extent. So we have the benedipine, which has got a T, uh, T channel blocking effect. Then we have azalidipine, which again has got a T cell blocking effect. So they tend to have lesser pedal edema as compared to uh, amlodipine. And again, as Dr. Tripathi was talking about the T channels present in the glomerulus, they also bring down the glomerular hypertension and therefore reduce some to some degree the proteinuria. So they have an advantage of not only having less of pedal edema, but also less proteinuria with the uh, newer calcium channel blockers. And then again about the sympathetic drive that we were talking about, cylindropine, of course, with the N type of channel blocking, you bring down the adrenergic drive in these patients and therefore bring down the pulse rate, lesser palpitation, lesser tachycardia, lesser what you call sweating and other problems which are associated with increased adrenergic drive. So these are some of the other advantages over amlodipine when you use these drugs. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, one question has come from question answer. Uh, this, uh, and that question is open for any of the panelists. He has asked uh, that, uh, Dr. Jain has asked that uh, these L, N, and T stands for what? Their full form. What is L, N, and T? I think you should answer yourself, bro. Nursing. <laughs> uh, these basically L and T and N, they are basically stands for the tubules. L type tubules, T type tubules, and N type tubules. That is from where the calcium is being supplied. So because of that, these names are given. We go for the next part. And Dr. M Dr. Vivek has already talked that the CCBs are not the first line drug for most of the coronary artery disease patients. But uh, my question is that whether if you want to give CCBs in CAD patients, then what is your preference, amlodipine or any other liver calcium channel block? Now, you see, I think uh, it's very important here because uh, sometimes uh, the physicians are guided by the people who are visiting them because this is very important because a lot of time there is a pharmaceutical company person who comes with the various type of uh, formulations and of course, which are very important for us to understand and do. So of all the, uh, you see coronary artery disease, as I told you, especially in a chronic stable angina, we are giving amlodipine or non dihydrodipine medicines, especially in association with beta blockers. So whenever there's a patient who has got a requirement for beta blocker, or there is no contraindication for beta blocker, then of course, and with a small high blood pressure element, then we always give amlodipine or any other compound with a similar group like cinnabipine or phenylidipine. But mostly we are using amlodipine as Maroja sought out that most of the trials have shown superior. The trials have been done mostly with the amlodipine group and we are quite satisfied unless there's a gross pedal edema and then you may switch on to the cinnabipine or phenylidipine type of compounds. Then of course, but then there are no major uh, brands available which are a combination of uh, amlodipine with metho sorry, uh, calcium blocker with the uh, beta blockers. 
So we stick to mostly amlodipine unless there is a contraindication. But coming to those patients who are having contraindication for beta blocker, I told you that in coronary artery disease, it is better to give calcium blocker in association with beta blockers in general. But when there is a contraindication to beta blockers, then you can switch on to, because Hilkazam, which is a non dihydrobenzene enzyme, which has got the AV blocker effect, this reduces the uh, heart rate as well as it has got the coronary vasodilatation. So this is a compound which is being used by me personally, Hilkazam. I use it quite often. If there is a systolic functions are normal, if the patient's heart functions are preserved, that means ejection pressure should be at least more than 45 to 50 percent. Then I have no hesitation if there's a beta blocker contraindication, then I would use. Dilkazam as a primary choice without addition of any beta blocker or uh, and in case if you require to control the blood pressure along with that, there is no harm in using the two calcium blockers, especially amlodipine and dilkazam both. Because if there's a requirement to high blood pressure along with the requirement for the angina, then you may use both of them. So I summarize again, amlodipine if combination with beta blocker in CRD patients most of the time. If not, if beta blockers are contraindicated for any reason, you cannot give it, then it's better to give Dilgazem if it is, there is no major systolic dysfunction. Thank you, Dr. Vivek, for uh, clearing all this doubt that uh, whether we can use in angina or not, or in CAD or not. And that is very correct that uh, you, all the panelists are again and again stressing that we are not to use CCDs. That is very, very important. And one question has been asked by uh, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari. And that question is a very important one because recently we had a international seminar and in that contrary to our belief, uh, the, the panelist was talking about that combining the dihydropyridine CCBs and di dihydropyridine CCBs and non-dihydropyridine CCBs combining together. We usually say that they should not be combined, but he presented a lot of data that they should be combined. What is the take of our panelists, whether we can combine dihydropyridine CCBs with the non-dihydropyridine CCBs? And if at all they are combined, then what is the uh, evidence and what are the advantages? I think most difficult question has been put. No, I, I, I think I explained a little in this. Way. I have no other reason other than in isolated hypertension. I don't know what are the data, but you have a CAD where you have a very high blood pressure, which is you could require a safe uh, medicine, which is a calcium blocker. And if the patient has a contraindication and is a chronic stable angina with a preserved ejection fraction, with a normal systolic uh, functions, then there is no harm. In fact, it's useful to add the dihydropyridine, non-dihydropyridine, diltiasm plus amlodipine. Although the combinations are not available, but there is no reason why it cannot be used. First of all, and it should be used Especially when beta blocker, which is a mainstay for the treatment of high uh, for the angina, cannot be used for any reason. Beta blocker, there are a lot of contraindications, but still uh, we are able to use it. But there are few people say that bisoprolol can be added, which is a very highly selective or a beta blocker. But I will still say if there's a contraindication to beta blockers, avoid it. Add diltiasm if there is systolic functions are preserved. And this is the only way reason I, fi I find. Manoj can answer it better. That if in a CAD patient, you can always add it if there's contraindication to beta blocker. Both diltiazem and amlodipine with a specific separate indications. Anything else, Manoj or Dr. Tripathi can add on this question? Yes, sir. Anything to be added by our panelists, Professor Tripathi and Dr. Manoj Srivastava? Regarding the combining the Dihydropyridine plus non dihydropyridine Nephrologists have used this combination. Yes, I'm coming to the same question. Systolic hypertension. It is so difficult to control systolic hypertension in patients who are approaching endoscopic renal disease because of the severe glomerular sclerosis. The whole architect, the afferent arteriole, the Bowman's capsule is totally distorted. If you sometimes look, the autopsy, we have seen autopsies in PGI, Chandigarh before. Uh, if you look at autopsies of these patients who die because of the chronic kidney disease, it is like a bean. It's like a uh, almond, dry almond, where you don't see any structure into the kidney. So what happens, there is a systolic hypertension which does not listen to any drug other than the very potent old traditional calcium channel blocker, amrodipine. So you have to use one group there 
and as Dr. Gupta was also talking, there are these patients also have some concomitant arrhythmias, especially the, uh, the where you need to block the SA node also, block the AV node also, like Verapamil, like Diltiagem. And they have also component of the coronary artery disease. All C8 patients of chronic kidney disease have some small component of coronary artery disease. Uh, sir, another question is that whether the CCBs also reduce albuminuria, although you have already told that they reduce albuminuria. This question is the second part of the question. That and whether... therefore, and they do not all list answer because we don't have a... has potentials to reduce protein. Uh, pressure would be normal, proteinuria would decrease. But cylindrapine has an advantage. It also works on the photocyte. The photocyte of the efferent of the Wormus capsule. And because of the improvement into the photocyte and the filtration pore is reduced because of reduction in the filtration pore and on the endothelial side, protein urea is decreased. So that is the added advantage. And these are the, some of the situations where people have used the traditional calcium channel blocker, the newer calcium channel blocker, Yes. So, oh, another trial from Australia. They use central inhibiting four to five drugs together. Yes, yes. Dr. Maheshwari is probably. Yeah, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, moving ahead, moving ahead. The another question to Professor Tripathi is, sir, uh, how, what are the various side effects of CCB and how they can be managed? Dr. Gupta already said. Manoj also said. Peripheral edema is one of the most embarrassing situation. And everybody looks at your feet in India. When he touches your feet, looks at the feet, and he said rightly, Manu said right answer, that it only dilates the capillary uh, arteries and capillaries doesn't dilate the traditional veins. So you remain uh, edematous. I must tell you that even cylindropine, venidopine, when you increase the desirable dose to get the pharmacological response, there is pedal edema because of this reason. But because they open the lymphatics, and they also, to some extent, dilate the vein. So return becomes better. They squeeze out and the profit is less. But there are the people, and you can segregate them. The elderly people, the people who do not walk, the people who have a concomitant proteinuria, pedal edema would be more whatever calcium channel blocker you use. And this pedal edema would not respond to diuretic. It is only the physiotherapy Otherwise, diuretics usually do not listen to speed edema. Number one, what the advantage is you can block the other peripheral diseases. It's a drug of choice and it does give you the good response. So these are the reasons where we prefer to use calcium channel blocker, and uh, they reduce the proteinuria, they reduce the albuminuria, they also take care of the uh, bready arrhythmia, some of the patients have bready You give half tablet, and the heart is the blocker, and, and so I think these are the situation where traditional calcium chain blockers are more potent, more durable. They have, we have studied them for a longer time. Nevertheless, newer calcium channel blocker, uh, which blocks all L and T, all the three channels, have their place in mind, and we have, we want to refer these important issues. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, sir, another question has come from the 
uh, one of our doctor, Dr. Vinod Darda, and that is the role of CCB in post-stroke hypertensive patient. Any panelists? Yeah. Nicardipine and nimodipine, these are the two which are specific to the brain and cerebral circulation. They had to prevent the conversion of a non hemorrhagic smoke where you think this patient could have an area of the ischemia, they have an area of the hyperemia, followed by a vasodilatation. These are the patients who would require for the prevention and the recurrence of a stroke. And there, the calcium chain block, especially the nimodipine and the nicardipine, they have been found to be very useful. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is to Dr. Manoj Srivastava. Which other antihypertensive is having best synergistic effect with CCB? Uh, before I answer that question, there are two other questions, I think, which remain a bit unanswered. The yeah. first one about the L and T classification. L simply stands for long acting. T is for the transit acting. This for shorter duration of action. So there are T channels. And the N is for neuronal. That is, they present on the nerves. So they have been taken from those. Neuronal is N, T is for transient channels, and N is for long acting. So L and T is basically the uh, abbreviations they have used. The other hand, I just want to comment that the, all these uh, calcium channel blockers which have got T cell effect, T channel effect, including the non dihydropyridines, they all have a uh, proteinuria reducing effect. So whether it's cylindipine, azalidipine, even benedipine, and the verapamil. Verapamil is also a very good proteinuria reducing agent amongst the calcium channel blockers. So all of them do produce uh, a reduction in the calcium channels. Now coming on to the combination. Now all sorts of combinations are available as far as the calcium channel blockers are there. And uh, it all depends on the patient type where you want to give that particular uh, antihypertensive agent. Now, as, as as most of us have been talking about the adrenergic drive and the reflex tachycardia, so most of the time, whenever we're giving a calcium channel blocker, we usually add a beta blocker just to reduce the, what you call the reflex tachycardia and the uh, adrenergic symptoms like palpitation and sweating, etc. So that can be done, though this is a combination which is most frequently being used. But I think physiologically, this combination of amlodipine with a RAS blocker is even a better combination because when you give amlodipine, you have vasodilatation and there's always an associated reflex activation of the RAS system to overcome the blood pressure fall. So if that is taken care of by the RAS system, then probably you'll have a much better what you call blood pressure reduction. And therefore, large number of combinations of ARBs and ACE inhibitors with calcium channel blockers are available and we are using it and we are finding them quite useful. And lastly, a combination with diuretic. Now this would be a very, what you call, a very strong and very powerful combination as we all agree. And when you add a diuretic to the calcium channel blockers, most of those hypertension which are not being easily controlled are brought down. So I think this would be again one of the reasons and as for example even the elderly patient, patient with isolated systolic hypertension, again this would be a good combination because both the drugs are safe in elderly population, are recommended in the elderly population as well as they also bring down the isolated systolic hypertension. So this combination of calcium channel blocker with a low dose diuretic, I think the thiazide diuretic, this is also a very good combination and we can we are all using all these three combinations, they are all available in market. Of course, the patient profile is the most important thing. And uh, a last one point again, I have just to mention that about the um, post-stroke, we all had trials, which is the largest, one of the largest calcium channel blocker trial, which compared amlodipine with lisinopril and found that amlodipine has got a much better secondary prevention of stroke as compared to the uh, lisinopril. So I think uh, we also have a trial, a big trial of amlodipine also, which suggests that it can be used in for stroke prevention. Very correctly pointed out by Dr. Manoj, but in another trial where the trough peak ratio was taken in account, uh, the amlodipine was found better than the Valsartan. So there are some trials which show that CCBs are better drugs for stroke prevention as well. Uh, next question is to Dr. Vivek Gupta. 
that uh, uh, in various comorbidities of hypertension, how you place CCBs? So again, to simplify, what are the comorbidities? Will high blood pressure. Comorbidities in high blood pressure will be diabetes, will be coronary artery disease, will be stroke, can be obesity, can be albuminuria, can be coronary kidney disease, and of course, acute kidney disease or acute heart failure. So, uh, coming to the diabetes part, as I was knowing, I was I have a little uh, knowledge about it. That sometimes calcium channel blockers can also precipitate by uh, increasing the insulin resistance. So, whether that is true or not, so but this is not a major reason why you should not use calcium blockers in diabetes. But of course, we have to be a little cautious and, and see HbA1c repeatedly every six months at least. Coming to the coronary, cor of course, uh, my topic, which is called CAD, I've already explained that chronic uh, or acute and stable angina, angina, chronic stable angina or acute stable angina, the preferred will be amlodipine with beta blocker or amlodipine or, or, or non dihydropyrin which is dilkazem, if there are beta blockers are contraindicated. Coming to the chronic kidney disease, of course, the doctor uh, uh, Kamlakar Tripathi has already answered that there are medicines which have got a proven efficacy in reducing the albuminuria and progression to the severe renal dysfunctions. Coming on to the association with stroke, I'm just summarizing what has been talked about. Stroke, as uh, we have told, that uh, post stroke hypertension, of course, uh, as Manoj was saying, that uh, lisinopril with amlodipine can be a good combination. But of course, uh, age old is that lamotipine is a better compound as compared to amlodipine. But of course, the uh, newer trials are coming up, and uh, we have, I think, the most important and mostly most studied compound is amlodipine of all the uh, calcium channel blocker. Coming to the obesity, I don't think there's any relationship except that pedial edema looks further. You, you don't observe pedial edema in obese patient, and therefore you can use it more easily because pedial edema in a slim and thin will be much more easily uh, discernible rather than obese patients. And the last would be the uh, COVID-19. This is very important. You see, the COVID-19, we have been all impacted and we are still uh, fearing the third wave. I was on TV in the morning talking about Delta on the Indian news in the morning. So uh, there have been few articles which have shown that control of blood pressure in a hospitalized patients, hypertension control in hospitalized patients in COVID-19, the mortality has been found to be statistically significantly reduced with amlodipine. If you're using amlodipine as a calcium blocker, as a treatment for hypertension, as a comorbid condition in COVID-19, and there's a recent article which is published in May, I'm just going through this, and they've shown that significant reduction and this is possibly related to amlodipine rather because they have found the statistical values of the various uh, uh, statistical importance of various compounds used during that hospitalized patient and large number of patients who are used to, and therefore COVID-19 again if you have to treat high blood pressure the amlodipine is a better choice than other uh, calcium blockers or any other compound for that matter. I think I've summarized all these comorbidities uh, obesity, high blood pressure, uh, with the diabetes, with CAD, with chronic kidney disease, with stroke, all these patients, you have to understand that calcium blocker, one most important contraindication would be, most important, which I want to repeat for the interest of the physicians, systolic heart failure, please avoid using, especially dilgazem. I've seen a lot of patients are still having, as a nursing was saying, that a lot of patients, a uh, lot of physicians may still have a continuation of this. But one more comorbidity, which I've forgotten, is arrhythmia. If you have a uh, arrhythmias like uh, subtle uh, supraventricular arrhythmias. I mean, if you do, do, do the halter, you find five, six beads uh, coming up and you require a calcium blocker. If the systolic functions are normal, I think if there is a still heart rate which is not low, about 80 to 90 or 100, I'm talking clinical uh, case scenario, please use, you can use diltiasm as compared to any other if the systolic function is normal. In a subtle, subtle means not major causes, but palpitation is there and you do halter three days or seven days, you find multiple few episodes of five, six supraventricular coming up, not SVT completely. And these here, I think Delcazem will have major edge than any other combined, or else you use beta blockers. Very well summarized, Dr. Vivek Gupta. And uh, it is very, very important to point to this point that uh, the in uh, systolic heart failure, especially with the reduced ejection fraction, CCBs has no role. I cannot forget one patient who was controlled from last five years, he was having ejection fraction of only 25%. And suddenly he came to me and only five days before he was prescribed Licardia XL. And he died within five days. Within five days. 
these are so very I, important actually these are very very important points which are this is these are advantage this is actually the, the purpose of these webinars that yeah. one should not commit mistake rather than yeah. you treat it well but a small mistake can be really dangerous for the patients yes yes and uh, one more question has come from the participants and again dr vinod is asking very good questions and he is asking that uh, regarding the uh, end organ damage which anti hypertensive ccb or arb which one is better or any particular combination is better re uh, reducing the uh, end organ damage i think manoj has answered this very well that yeah. the combination of the, uh, calcium blocker with the arb is a very good thing because both have been found especially arbs are very well known to reduce the end organ damage wherever it is so end organ because there is ras blocker renin and renin and the tensin aldosterone and the tensin receptor blocker so this is going to come if if you have an addition of calcium blocker which also has got some effect in reducing or preventing or prolonging the end organ damage the combination should always be used especially in patients of diabetes mellitus where i think this is what manoj can answer it but uh, but i my would be that combination i i this is my, my learning for me also that when you are using you have a possibility of using combination if you but you cannot use combination all the time because you see the blood pressure goes down drastically patient of 140 90 150 90 alone calcium blocker is more than enough uh, associated with a beta blocker but when you have very high blood pressure creatinine of 2 or something where you can still use ras blockers arbs then of course these are the patients where the blood pressure is not getting controlled and you have fetal edema the combination of arbs with a calcium blocker can be a useful uh, modality especially in prevention of end organ damage Thank you, thank you, Dr. Vivek. Dr. Vivek, there was a question from my side. Uh, when we in college, we used to uh, learn that delta M would be the drug of choice in non-ST elevation MIs. Is it still standing true, or do you have changed the the prospect has changed about delta M in the NST MI? No, no, no. Actually, the reason is that at that time there were trials were not that much with beta blockers. Now beta blockers have gone so high. We have so many good beta blockers available that the role and you cannot normally give uh, diltiazem with beta blocker. There is no need to give it because sometimes it can cause dangerous uh, bradyarrhythmias. So at that time, of course, it was because at that time beta blockers were evolving. Now beta blockers have just as far as non-ST elevation MI or ST elevation MI. or a chronic heart failure beta blocker has to be used and therefore there is no role of isolated diltiazem in non ST elevation MI those were the 80s when we were thinking that yeah. 90s or early 90s beta blockers people were really fearing to give beta blockers in even chronic heart failure now beta without beta blocker a heart failure prescription you feel something is really missed out and you can't do it because the pro life like prolongation of the life span prolongation of the the, the cardiac mortality in fact it is something looks astonishing that how a beta blocker which is actually a negative uh, inotropic and negative chronotropic uh, property can lead to increase in ejection fraction over a long a prolonged period of 2 to 3 years usage and this is happening so this is a very important you see uh, is a physiologist a doctor nursing and you all know the same person who put on the who had, who uh, investigate who found out Uh, beta blocker was William Black, as I remember, and the same person got the other proton pump inhibitor, or it was the same. He he got he and he got the Nobel Prize for both of them together. William Black was the person who who uh, found for the first time the beta blockers. Thank you. And now I invite uh, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari. Yeah, sir. Sir, thank you. thank you dr verma and thank you all our panelists who have done very nice uh, uh, talk on the uh, calcium channel blocker in fact uh, calcium channel blockers has always been a prescriber's choice as far as the anti hypertensives are concerned most of the prescribers feel very much comfortable in prescribing any calcium channel blocker in fact i have seen many people prefer to start the anti hypertensive therapy with the calcium channel blocker and uh, reasons is quite obvious this is very well tolerable by by the patient in fact in the early part of the disease they are very nicely tolerated in fact once the patient is uh, in the late part of the disease definitely we can have the fetal edema kind of the problems with the calcium channel blockers but uh, today all our panelists has focused uh, that where it should not be used and that is very much important especially for the prescribers those who are willing to use them 
in the early part of the disease of course it is recommended in most of the guidelines for a long time that you should start a treatment earlier it was recommended to start a treatment with the diuretics later on it has come up with the ras blockers now the recommendation says that you can start either ras blocker or calcium channel blocker whatever you want to start but your blood pressure should be controlled it should be uh, essentially be less than 130 80 and that should be the message of this uh, webinar today we should be very much careful while prescribing these drugs about their side effects about their adverse events about their uh, precautions which is to be taken where not to prescribe at the same time we must ensure that blood pressure must be less than 130 80 for a nice outcome in the longer duration especially if we really wish to keep the life expectancy of our patients uh, up to a a uh, good level or up to a respectable level then it is very much needed i think that is enough for today yeah just yeah. a small uh, yeah. the full name is james william black he he discovered simetidine he discovered propranolol first and later after 10 years he discovered in 70s simetidine the same person and both are very important medicine one is for acidity another is for of course our propranolol has done wonderful job and then further metoprolol and all this came same person james w black so h2 H2 blocker not the proton bomb inhibitor is so h2 blocker this is yeah. what i'm saying h2 okay. yeah. this is h2 blocker simetidine i said simetidine yes simetidine now we are forgetting simetidine and ranitidine <laughs> and we are using like left and right now sc lock and all those now we are proton bomb inhibitors we are talking so i was thinking of that it is actually for simetidine he discovered yeah. simetidine 10 simetidine years later the after propranolol first was his discovery of propranolol and later simetidine that's why i was trying to make a modification and digression regard uh, our kgmu department of physiology is also known first time professor rc shukla she described the double action of acetylcholine which is already in the literature double action of acetylcholine and uh, at uh, he was working with dr penter at that time he described this uh, so uh, the webinar was very good and we had very good interaction and uh, very good questions and i think uh, uh, time does not permit us to move ahead and uh, so with the summary by dr anil maheshwari i think we will like to end here before that i will invite uh, venkat raman if he is here for word of thanks very much sir thank you very much So we at Knowledge Bridge, the content partner of Indian Society of Hypertension, are extremely thankful to Dr. Anuj Maheshwari and Dr. Narsingh Verma for today's webinar. It has been a pleasure to have the esteemed speakers with us today, Dr. Kamla Katripathi, Dr. Manoj Shivastha, Dr. Vivek Gupta, for enlightening the participants on calcium channel blockers in the management of hypertension with your valuable experiences. I'm sure these webinars do contribute in science, and these will be made available soon. the so called knowledge network that indian society of hypertension is planning to have by the end of this year and all these webinars shall be made uh, as part of it so that anybody can come in and enlighten themselves in the wide topic of hypertension thank you very much uh, that's the last comment uh, professor yashpal sharma who is head of department hod cardiology from uh, sg uh, pgi chandigarh was here to meet me and he was just listening everything he's a very important cardiologist my friend he is a yeah. head of department and professor of cardiology in pgi chandigarh can you show your face here come from this side yeah, welcome sir welcome welcome sir you just sitting here to sharma ji samne aao sharma ji samne aao hamare purane dost hai sharma ji sharma ji idhar aao idhar aao idhar aao se milne aaye the maine kaha thoda ruk lo zara sun sara sun le ha 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 kya baat hai kya baat hai ye param mitra hai hamare ye आपकी हमारी मीटिंग होती थी अपने निर्माण ये कम टू गिव एक एक एग्जाम फॉर द एम्स डीएम कार्डियोलॉजी तो हमसे चाय पीने आए थे हम लोग चाय पी ही रहे थे तो प्रोग्राम शुरू हो गया हमने कहा चलो सबसे मुलाकात हो जाएगी थैंक यू थैंक्स 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 फॉर कमिंग ओके लास्ट थिंग बट बिफोर आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट यू ऑन डॉक्टर्स डे वी आर डूइंग अनदर लाइव म्यूजिक प्रोग्राम मनोज विल सिंग दिस टाइम <laughs> and uh, for doctors day and i'll 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 request knowledge partner to also uh, disseminate the zoom link which i'll send to nursing verma so that more and more doctors can join and we'll have most probably 
either Udit Narayan or some other big singer or Noob Jolota uh, for this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation, Vivek. Thank you. Good, good to meet you all. We are all best mates and friends. Thank you. Thank you.